Welcome to PAC's new journey of communication. We are starting a PACT point of view virtual. We are meeting with our staff on Zoom and talking about adoption, race, and family, how they currently intersect with all of the current events going on in our world. We hope you find this useful, thought-provoking, and helpful to start conversations within your own family and communities. We invite you to like, share, spread the word. PACT is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to serve adopted children of color. We provide not only adoptive placement, but lifelong education support and community for adoptees and all of their families, birth first families and adoptive families on issues of adoption and race. Be sure to check out our website, pactadopt.org, and find us on social media. Welcome back to our second PACT virtual um, point of view. I'm going to go ahead and ask everybody who is with me to introduce themselves. They're going to give their name, their pronoun, the position in their, their position in the Adoption Constellation, and their role at PACT, and then we will get started. So my name is Katie Wynan. I use she, her pronouns. I am an international transracial adoptee, and I am the adoption social worker at PACT. I work in placement. Beth. Hi, my name is Beth Hall. I am the executive director of PACT. I am use she, her as my pronouns. I am an adoptive parent. I have adult children. I also grew up in an adopted family. I'm the sibling of, I'm the non-adopted sibling of an adoptee. And yeah, that's me. Thank you. Susan. I'm Susan Dushaget Alexander. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the adoption agency supervisor at PACT and the first slash birth family specialist. I'm also a transracial adoptee and a first mother. Deanna. Hi, my name is Deanna. My pronouns are she and her. I am the camp director for both PAC Camp West and PAC Camp East, and I am an adoption ally. Ben. Hi, I'm Ben. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I uh, am a transracial adoptee myself, and I'm PAC Youth Coordinator. And Malika. Hi, I'm Malika Parker, and I'm an adoptive parent. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Adoptive Parents of Color Collaborative Director. Perfect. Welcome. So a couple of weeks ago, PACT put out a statement um, regarding the verdict on the Breonna Taylor case. And we talked about our next point of view being about that and about Breonna and how we're thinking and feeling. Um, before we open it up to dialogue, we do just wanna let everybody that is watching know that this conversation we feel is very important for all members of the adoption constellation who love and support adopted children of color. Um, and we really hope that everybody is involved. We will talk about the first birth parent perspective or responses. We'll probably talk about adopted um, adults and adopted people responses, adoptive parent responses. So um, we hope everybody finds this helpful. So we are going to open it up for just a dialogue type style. Um, I will open up the floor for whoever wants to speak or kick us off. And if you want me to come back to our statement, we were, um, PACT had a pretty solid statement about the verdict not being okay. And we felt like there was no, it was not justice for Brianna. Um, we were pretty upset by it. We committed to continue to fight for um, people of color, specifically black lives. Um, and I know it has been a like two weeks maybe. Um, but it's still being talked about. It was a question on the vice presidential debate um, just yesterday, October 7th. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to talk about that and how they answered, if anybody wants to talk about some of the reactions and feedback we got as an organization from our statement um, or how people are feeling. Those of you that serve certain constituencies, any feedback or dialogue that you've had with them, um, we can open it up. I've said this to you all um, in our private meetings. I just don't understand what's so difficult about saying we messed up. Uh, this young lady lost her life 
um, I didn't even know what wanton endangerment was. I had to Google it. I had never heard of it before. And it's just appalling, offensive. Uh, to me, I am a parent of a 23 year old black woman and my daughter could easily be Breonna Taylor. Um, and thinking of her mother and her family, they're showing us that her life did not matter. The way I read the charges for the one officer of wanton endangerment was the walls of the neighbor were more important than the loss of Breonna Taylor's life. And that's appalling to me. I think one of the things that um that have come up in kind of the aftermath of the verdict and um, just conversations after is this debate about whether or not we trust the system or we trust the laws or we trust um, even policing in this country. And to me, that's not even a question, right? Like the fact that there is any debate about somebody's life life being lost means that we have to revamp the whole thing even if if it's just one time but we know that this happens over and over and over again and you know i think the reality is that it's scary for people right like so the fear of white folks with privilege um are worried and scared about what it means to lose that to lose the protection that is afforded to them and their wealth um, the protection that is afforded to their children and their families. And for some, it is irrelevant, the cost of that protection. Um, we saw that on display in the debates last night. We see that in conversations. We've seen that in some of the responses that we've received as a result of um, the statement that we put out, that um, it is hard for people to imagine that the country that they live in would just systematically take people's lives and freedoms. Um, and meanwhile, for families of color, it's terrifying to think, just like Deanna said, that at any moment that could be your child, right? Like that for many families right now is some of the safest times for their children because everyone's at home. Um, because you can't, you can't trust that when you send your children to school, um, if they go to college, if they go to the store down the street, that they will come back home. And that is unacceptable on so many levels. And I think, um, you know, I think that when we um, imagine what's possible and a lot of the conversations that are happening right now about defunding the police, it's allowing people the opportunity to think about a world that's different, a world that like everyone feels safety and inclusion um, and lift it up. And that means that some folks have to give up what they have in order for everybody to have what they need. Well said, Malika. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, working in placement, a lot of my pre-adoptive parents, um, a handful of them responded and were just like, thank you for making that statement. Um, and I actually, I, I work with a lot of interracial couples and I got the response from a couple of the non-POC um, partner or parent that was like, this is really important. It was important to my partner. It's going to be important to the child that we bring into our family. Um, so it was like those moments of hope that I was able to latch on to. And then I also had to go through my day with like seeing all of my black friends on social media, just, oh, wow. <laughs> um, just being scared for their life. And the fact that we also got responses about people saying, this isn't such a big deal. Look at all these facts. Why are you doing this? And then seeing my friends who are terrified for their life, it was also just very clearly very hard for me um, on top of everything that we're currently living through. Yeah, I think for me, it's, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think for me, it's just becoming really hard as a youth educator to find places of positivity within this news. And, you know, I don't think this is ever something positive to hear for any community. 
Um, but truthfully, I think the main problem for me is stemming from, you know, this is so frequent that it's become almost impossible for me to not come at these things with a heavy bias and to not really get angry alongside them um, when reacting to this stuff. And, you know, I know that this isn't my position as a leader and as somebody who should be, I guess, narrating or mediating these kind of conversations to then jump in and be so strong in my opinion on one side or the other. Um, but I think that that's just very telling on where we are, you know, as, as uh, you know, society and as a world um, that this has become the norm. And so it has been able to be, be swept under the rug and we've been able to, you know, make these things more and more numbing to us. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've just gotten to a point where I've realized, you know, each time something new is happening, it's become harder and harder for me to find a healthy way to bring it up to the kids and to find a healthy starting point on, you know, where does this discussion go? Where do I want it to end? Um, you know, and I think that that just is a mirror image of our society and that there isn't much there, um, you know, for us to go off of and, and to really lead because it's unfair and this is just unjust and and that's just the fact behind it um and when things seem to be that way it almost goes back to elementary kind of things for me where it's like you know right is right wrong is wrong um and and that seems like a talk we have when we're much younger than the kids that i deal with so it, it, yeah for me i'm i feel like i'm never scared to have the conversation but i'm rapidly losing ground on where that should be started at. Susan. Yeah, I think, um, you know, growing up in a white adoptive family um, that did benefit and continues to benefit from white supremacy and by extension, I benefited um, and had to um, kind of question and learn and and I'm still questioning and learning and figuring out like what it means to be you know an ambiguous you know light-skinned Latina woman in the U.S. Um, how to be um, uh, more vocal about my belief that Black Lives Matter and how to be more um, outspoken and more active in um, um, pushing back against white supremacy and racism when I see it. It's something that is still a work in progress for me and something that um, one of the ways that it plays out right now is with, you know, on social media, like when one of my white family members posted the thing like questioning the facts about Breonna Taylor's case and, um, you know, like the anger that I felt. And, and this is just for a moment speaking about transracial adoptees, including those who are not black, <laughs> um, but feeling that like, wow, like this family just does not get it. This family doesn't care. This family doesn't see me. This family doesn't see people of color. My family is like, you know, um, you know, just would not be willing to let go of some of the safety and protections in order to make the country more safe for other people. And so, um, you know, just for those of you who are parenting children of color, even those who are not black, just knowing that like what your family, what your extended family is putting out there um, can be really um, harmful and really, um, you know, your children see, your children are feeling and getting like, okay, who in my family cares and who doesn't? And, you know, I have one cousin, <laughs> one white cousin who consistently posts like, you know, Black Lives Matter, like, you know, um, uh, you know, just whatever, like, she's just like constantly posting about like, whatever, like racial topics are in the news. And I'm like, thank you. Like, thank you so much that like, but it's just one and I have a big, <laughs> a big adoptive family. And um, so yeah, I just, you know, it's, um, it's a work in progress for me. And uh, I, um, not being very articulate, but I, um, 
as a non-Black person of color, I, I continually want to make myself more and more uncomfortable um, because I, I have to, like, that's, that's what I need to be doing. And one of the ways that I'm doing that is, like, trying to challenge my, within my own family, which as an adoptee is very scary sometimes. Yeah, thank you. I think um, for some, thank you for that, Susan. That was really beautifully said. Um, I think for many families, we're often regardless of the racial background, they want to provide some kind of uh, shield for their children from all of this just nastiness in the world. And um, I, you know, I when we think about adoption and when we think about how children joined our families that the very system that put them in our families, regardless of private or public or international, that it's deeply flawed. And so for any of us to have this illusion that um, our children haven't experienced oppression and deep, deep, deep impacts of white supremacy is flawed. Um, the fact that, that many of us are parenting children that could not stay with the family they were born to is because of that same system. Um, and so when we're thinking about how to talk about all of this stuff, I think that um, having conversations about the systems of adoption are like, those are very much intertwined. And I don't think that those are conversations that enough of us have um, as parents with our children um, about how just like deeply flawed the system is that brings them to our family and that as adoptive parents, we are participating in that same system um, and um, and to make the connections of how for ourselves and for our children um, of the different ways that it shows up. So Brianna Taylor losing her life is one version of that. Um, families of color not being supported in parenting their children is another version of the like just lack of acknowledging the humanity of people of color. Mm -hmm. I been thinking a lot about as we talk as we talk here about um, it, it, it's it's horrible to me as a white person who therefore totally benefits from white supremacy and is not experiencing what um, both my children each of you and many people of color that I love and those I don't know but but I also think about the kids and this notion that I fear hugely that somehow if we don't talk about it or if we pretend things are the way they ought to be or are okay, that that will lead to building happy, healthy, resilient children. And I feel like that's the polar opposite is true. If we don't acknowledge what is, how can we help our children develop the muscles to be strong? And I see that so much more powerfully in black and brown communities than I do in my own. And, and I, it's painful to me to see how many of us that are um, white in particular, but us as a larger community want to deny that reality that resilience comes from pushing back on what is wrong. It comes from fighting for justice. It comes from acknowledging what is beautiful and part of what is beautiful is standing up for what is right, but not from denying that. It just feels to me like all this, the, the ways that the country and that the response to the Breonna Taylor murder has been about you know, details and little, you know, um, you know, legal snafus or whatever. I mean, she died. She was, everyone agrees she was 100% innocent and she is dead. That, that is just unacceptable. And I, I don't, it's hard for me to understand how that can't be unacceptable to all of us. It's painful to understand, but it isn't. Thank you. I want to give us just a few more minutes. Um, anything else coming up for people? Conversations you've been having? 
feelings you've experienced, any of you parenting kids or um, supporting kids, working with first families who are talking about this, working with adoptees who are talking about this. My, my monthly group was on Tuesday night and um, this still comes up. Like it, majority of us are transracially adopted, raised by white parents. Um, and when, when people intro themselves, they're always like, oh, I have white Republican parents or white Christian fundamentalist parents, or that's where I was raised. And now all of these adoptees of color live in the Bay or in like a big city. And so many of them are talking about what their white adoptive parents are not doing right now. Um, those that are same race adoptees are talking about, this is a dialogue I've had with my parents my whole life and I'm still having to have it. Um, so it comes up within my group every month. <laughs> we meet every month and it comes up, not just Brianna Taylor, but just the injustices, what we experience as people of color um, and the support or lack of support we're getting from, for most of us, our white adoptive parents. And it's, it's kind of split. There are people who their parents are doing a lot and there are people who their parents are not doing anything. Um, and we're all ages, right? So there are 40 year olds who are like, my white adoptive parent doesn't understand why I'm out protesting or doing something else. And this is what I've had to deal with my whole life. They don't see me as a person of color. I feel a lot of the adoptees that are like, I'm not Brianna Taylor. I have my life, but I, I get it, right? Like people are just not seeing her. People don't see black women. People don't see people of color. And then a lot of these adoptees are like, I'm finally starting to realize my family doesn't really see me um, and how challenging that is and what they're trying to navigate while they're living, like I said before, like while they're living through everything else that's going on in our country, they're also trying to figure out that piece. And like, as Susan said, it is hard as an adoptee to push against your adoptive parent or to raise your voice in a predominantly white um, environment. Yeah, I would definitely say from my group and listening to a lot of the feedback, um, I would say it's, it's split kind of like you're saying, Katie, but I'd say the, the most common pattern that I noticed was that uh, a lot of the kids who were transitionally adopted, who were black, um, seemed to find it very hard. There was a barrier um, within the conversation due to the fact that they did not want to disrespect these specific white people who were their parents. Right. And so there's this love, this through and through love, right, for these people who are their parents. This is their family. Um, but they all, are, they, they all, for the most part, are also Black. And so the balancing act that they're dealing with, I think, has been very telling. And for us as uh, organization PACT, um, who provide for them, I think it is a, a very big subject to bring up that for them, it's not comfortable finding that middle ground so that they can feel reassured that they won't lose their parents or that they won't say something that would make their parents feel like, you know, they're 100% against them, but at the same time feeling comfortable enough to actually bring race up and to throw out the fact that, um, you know, they do feel like oppression has come from white people mainly and, you know, different conversations like that that do actually have to align with race at some point. Um, so for me, that was not shocking necessarily, but I think that with a lot of kids saying that even that thought overwhelmed them to the point where they would pass on the conversation was, was definitely something that I was like, I just had to take note of and, and really realize that that's all too common. And I even, to a certain extent, not being a Black adoptee, but being transracially adopted, did realize that there were certain situations in which that same exact feeling came over me and did hinder the way that I approached my parents. And so I do think that's another important thing to bring up is that sometimes these conversations are definitely wanting to be put onto the table. Um, but sometimes, you know, especially within our own, um, our own demographic, it's, it's tougher. And I think that that's valid as well for, for this conversation specifically, who a lot of those kids will feel as though they are Breonna Taylor. Um, but, probably have a different overall outlook on white people just because of their family. It's exhausting. Every day, it's something new. Um, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, the debates, 
all the things. It, it's exhausting. I'm not an adopted person. I'm not an adoptive parent. I am an ambiguous uh, black woman. I it, it's and I'm exhausted. It's like I'm waiting for the bottom to fall out, and all of this amongst a pandemic. It, it's exhausting, y'all. Yep. Malika or Susan, anything before we close? Um, I think so. One of the things that um, I'm hearing a lot from Black families, so and Black adults, we we started a call for Black adults that's once a month, um, and then we have a couple of calls for um, parents of color that also happen monthly, and you know, similar to what Deanna said, it's exhausting. So having holding the knowledge that this has been for forever, right? Like I think there's this um, expectation that sometimes as people of color, we hold for ourselves and that definitely society holds for us, that we're resilient, that we can hold it all, that we have all this expertise in how to navigate it. Um, and it almost always undermines the human impact of what it feels like to be holding all of this constantly. And then what it feels like to be holding this in the middle of a pandemic, like Deanna said, and for many parents also their children are at home um, and they're in school and then holding what their school experience might be while going through a pandemic, while dealing with racial injustice um, and often while still working and, um, and with the expectation of kind of just rolling like everything is normal. Um, and you know, I think that it's a system that just, it is not designed for us to survive. Um, and really any of us, right? Like it's, a, it's designed for um, money to survive, for capital to do well, but not for human beings and individuals to prosper. And definitely not the ones, those of us that sit at the bottom of the intersections of repression. Um, and so to you know, to just constantly be fighting for your own survival and the survival of people around you is brutal. Um, one of the things that I have also seen is people really looking for opportunities for joy. And that um, is a practice that I personally am like <laughs> working so hard at holding on to and finding. Um, and I think, you know, if there's one piece of like, advice, like unsolicited advice I could offer is, is that, is to like find opportunities to feel good, find opportunities for joy and pleasure, um, and find opportunities to be connected to people who make you feel good and who are really like lifting up exactly what it feels like to be in this moment. Um, because we're going to need that to like weather whatever this bottom falling out is going to look like. Um, yeah, those are, those are some things that are up for me. If there is nothing else, I will go ahead and wrap us up. Um, for everybody that has tuned in, I obviously, I hope you recognize the takeaway that PACT still fully stands behind Black Lives Matter and justice for Breonna Taylor. Um, and that hearing from everybody on here the adopted children of color that we all love, first birth family members, adoptive parents, adult adoptees who, I, I'm not an adoptive parent, but there are adopted kids of color that I love besides myself, um, <laughs> and allies and aunts and uncles, like what they are struggling too, right? So how are you holding your children? How are you starting a conversation with them? Ben told us they want to talk about it, but they're trying to figure out that balance, like Susan talked about, of how do I push, on my parents who I love and not, you know, so um, for those that tuned in, I hope you think about that and think about how you can um, support and connect and hold your adopted child of color who is also feeling and seeing and everything, feeling and seeing and hearing everything in the world and also watching you, the adults in their lives um, and what you're doing and how you're handling it. Or what so you're not doing. <laughs> or what you're not doing, yeah. Silence is a conversation what you're not doing is visible, who you're supporting, what you're talking about or not talking about. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, and we will see you next time for our next packed virtual point of view. Can you stop recording?